Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, dear guests, Valerie, Joseph Heller. My name is Gary Schwartz, and it's a great pleasure and privilege for me this evening to represent the John Adams Institute. This evening with Joseph Heller is organized by the John Adams Institute in its series, American Literature Today, with the indispensable help and cooperation of Mr. Heller's publisher, Antos, and of the American Book Center. If the John Adams Institute, which as you know, is fighting for its life, loses the struggle, after tonight, it can die happy. <laughs> With no disrespect to the many outstanding authors who in the past five years have preceded him in American literature today, we could not have claimed to live up to our name without bringing to you the American writer who has had a greater impact than any other on the post-World world, 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 Joseph Heller. The reception of his first novel, Catch-22, demonstrated a simple fact of immense significance. That is, that even in the aftermath of World War II, even in the middle of an equally global Cold War, even during a period when economics and technology were doing their best to depersonalize human beings and succeeding damn well at it, even then, Catch-22 demonstrated that the world's perception of itself was capable of being changed by the imagination of a writer. Not only did the phrase Catch-22 enter dozens of languages all over the world, not only did it give people a handle on perceiving and resisting abuse of power wherever it galled their lives, it did so moreover in such a way that everyone knew they had learned these things from a book, from a novel. Whether or not such a stunning accomplishment could have been achieved in the past decades by a writer from another country than the United States is a moot point. No one did it, but you can't, you can't eliminate the possibility. <laughs> what we can say is that it is not immaterial to the greatness and success of Catch-22 that its author is American. In that sense, Joseph Heller is the justification for the Johns Adams Institute and the series American Literature Today. Thanks to him, the act of reading and talking about literature, specifically American literature, is known by many people to be capable of going beyond mere delectation, that it can touch their inner and social lives powerfully, that it can provide them with the tools of humor and irony in their fight for dignity. Joseph Heller has done all of us a great favor in his new book, Closing Time, of picking up the thread of Catch-22 a generation later. Reading Closing Time was, for me, a wonderful experience in itself. But it also opened my eyes to an aspect of Catch-22 that I had not seen before. Closing Time is a book about the end of time or at least of mankind's time on Earth. It made me realize that Catch-22, as well, was not mainly about war and bureaucracy and absurdity, but about death. Catch-22 is the catch that prevents Yossarian from escaping his death. Closing time takes away that illusion for all of us. One could call this pessimism, but in the history of literature, I would place it in a different light. I see both books, rather, as present-day contributions to the age-old literature of learning to face death. To acknowledge the inevitability of death is a condition for living our lives to the full. Heller's ability to confront us with that truth, to make us enjoy it, puts him in a class of his own among living writers. And besides that, 
what more can you expect from a fellow human being? No wonder I felt like a friend of the author Joseph Heller before I became, to my great good fortune, a personal friend of the Mensch Joe Heller. This evening, Joseph Heller will read to you from closing time. His reading will be introduced by the English writer, translator, literary critic, and teacher at the University of Amsterdam, Anthony Paul. Upon Mr. Heller's request, there will be no intermission. We're going straight through. After the reading, Mr. Heller will be interviewed by Mr. Paul and will take questions from the audience. Following this, he'll sign copies of his book. Het roken is verboden in de rode hoed. Thank you and enjoy your evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I was planning to introduce Joseph Heller, uh, but I find that uh, Gary Schwartz has already done that so well uh, that I shall have to uh, improvise other remarks than the ones I was going to make. <laughs> to some extent. Uh, the first one, thing I was going to say, which I shall say anyway, um, is that it is a, indeed a privilege for me also <laughs> to introduce to you this evening Joseph Heller, one of the larger and more significant figures on the international literary scene, as well as one of the most readable and entertaining, often ferociously entertaining, of writers. I had the pleasure of meeting Mr. Heller a number of years ago when I interviewed him, and I'd like, as it were, to pick up from where we left off on that previous occasion by recalling an exchange towards the end of our conversation. Uh, I was sitting on one of those leather chairs, or pseudo-leather chairs, that makes squishy, squeaking noises when you move around on it. I have to explain this. Um, after an hour or so, hour and a half of conversation, I found I needed quite badly to have a pee. So I said, I'm sorry, Mr. Heller, uh, you'll have to excuse me, I, I need to go to the bathroom, polite American usage, to which Mr. Heller instantly replied, Oh, I thought it was the chair making those noises. <laughs> like that. And I, I tell this story as a, as a tiny example of Joseph Heller's style of humor, which has this way of making these intellectual leaps too quick for the mind to follow and to leave you a little disconcerted in danger of, if you continue the conversation, you're in a logical double bind, you can't get out. Uh, and the most famous example of that is, of course, the immortal catch. If you're crazy, you're excused flying, but if you, don't, uh, but if you apply to get out of flying, you're not excused because you can't be crazy. Uh, I apologize for reminding you of this, which you all knew already. But I'd like to also remind you of the immediate context of this passage in the book. Yossarian was moved very deeply by the absolute simplicity of this clause of Catch-22 and let out a respectful whistle. That some catch, that Catch-22, he observed. It's the best there is, Dr. Nika agreed. Yossarian saw it clearly in all its spinning reasonableness. There was an elliptical precision about its perfect pairs of parts that was graceful and shocking, like good modern art, and at times, Yossarian wasn't quite sure that he saw it all. This brings us close to the heart of the matter, it seems to me, of the world, the various worlds, indeed, of Mr. Heller's fiction. There is a catch behind the catch. The double bind is multiple one. It's not just a logical trap we're in, but there's this dilemma, too, of not knowing whether to despair at the state of things, or to gain intellectual and aesthetic delight from, from considering the elegant trap we are in. On the whole, the delight wins, at any rate, as long as we're reading. Another American Jewish humorist, Woody Allen, has somewhere the line, sex without love is a hollow, meaningless experience. He's lying there in bed. 
and, and, then he peers, and then he pauses and cheers up a bit and says, but as hollow, meaningless experiences go, <laughs> uh, I think uh, Joseph Heller's view of, the, of life is a bit like this. The world is a terrible, intolerable place. And it's going downhill. It always has done. There's really no hope for any of us. We're caught in a spiral of lies and absurdity. Life has no ultimate meaning. So we may as well enjoy it. It's too terrible to be taken seriously. But since he's nothing if not paradoxical, he does frequently take things quite seriously and with compassion. And although perhaps best known for the black, farcical manner of Catch-22, good as gold, most of God knows, the book that does for God what Catch-22 does for the US military, and parts of closing time. Um, but there is also a book I left out in, in this list, uh, Heller's second novel, Something Happened, and I would like to say a little bit about this book because I've just been reading it and realized what a wonderful book it is that I hadn't perhaps realized when I read it before as a callow young man 20 years ago. Um, you have to grow into a book like this. Uh, and I think that uh, it was certainly uh, not familiar enough to me and I think it may be less familiar in this country than it ought to be. Because it's often said Critics often say that Catch-22 was a hard act to follow, which obviously it was. But the comment seems to suggest that Joseph Heller had great difficulty in following it and may perhaps not even have succeeded in doing so, except possibly now with Closing Time, the sequel to Catch-22, as it's called. Now, I think this view of, of, of Joseph Heller's career is a, is a total misrepresentation uh, and misconception for something happened succeeds triumphantly uh, in following the act of Cash 22 uh, by performing a totally different act um, the two books are alike only in being ultimately I suppose about existential despair something happened is all about the terrors and doubts and failures uh, that belong to absolutely ordinary, typical, peaceful, modern lives, uh, treated uh, painfully, unbearably at times, but also wittily, readably, terrific dialogue, and, um, on the and passages which are mercilessly, merciless to oneself, to the, to the character, um, mercilessly analytic, but also there are occasional wonderful flights of poetic, associative writing which I would read if I had time, but I haven't, and you want me to get on anyway, so I won't. And with great compassion, as I've said. So I really would like to recommend to you this book, unless you already know it. Unlike other books, which at their moment were seen as uh, representative books of their time, I'm thinking of novels like Portnoy's Complaint or Couples, um, Something Happened um, is doing much better, I think, than these two uh, it's uh, 21 years old now, this book, and is ripening, just ripening nicely, just coming up to uh, its maturity, I think, somehow. A book with a permanent feel about it. As, of course, is Cash 22. Cash 22, it's been pointed out, is a book ostensibly about the Second World War, but in fact part of the Vietnam era, even though, characteristic paradox perhaps, even though, of course, it was published some time before the Vietnam War began. So, so it's, often, it's sometimes thought, I heard two, two people on the radio saying this the other day, uh, that, uh, th that uh, Catch-22 really took off with the Vietnam War and the anti-Vietnam movement. Um, I can testify from personal experience this was not so. Those of us who were just growing up in the early 60s uh, and read Catch-22 when it was a new book um, can testify that its appeal at that time was... Uh, not really so much a matter of uh, anti-war uh, sentiment. It was certainly refreshing to have a writer who treated war um, without any kind of respect uh, as, a, as a sort of ludicrous absurdity. Um, but the main thing about Cash-22 for a young reader at that time was that it was so generally 
liberating, being in fact ultimately not so much about war as about the ridiculousness of all organizations and all authority, which is a very pleasant message to hear at the age of 22 or so. I may say that reading the book again in, in middle age, it turns out to be a good deal more somber and not simply about the rejection of authority. Um, it's somber and it's more about the insoluble absurdities of the human condition. But still, the Vietnam War was no doubt good for the sales of Catch-22. That's a grotesque thing to say, is it not? <laughs> I was hoping you'd uh, realize. Uh, you, could also say, you could also say that uh, Catch-22 was good for the anti-war movement. That's a more respectable way of putting it. But the first way of putting it is in the spirit of the book itself, is it not, Nietzsche? You'll remember that Milo Minderbinder, for Milo Minderbinder, the Second World War was principally a business opportunity. And of course, as of course in his terms, he was absolutely right to do, to do so. And Milo Minderbinder is still with us, of course, in, in, in closing time. I think that what happened in the 60s was that with Vietnam, among other things, um, the world was turning out to be more like Catch-22 than many people had suspected. More and more readers were finding out that this novel was not just an anarchistic satire and an exploration of paradox, but also, at the same time, a more realistic work than most exercises in what is described as realism. Joseph Heller, like Kafka, with whom he has quite a bit in common, is pretty much a realist. I haven't left time uh, for closing time, but we'll, we'll, we'll be coming back to that. And at this point, I'd rather, and I'm sure you had all rather, I handed you over to Mr. Joseph Heller. Well, I think... This is a hard act to follow between Anthony Paul and Gary Schwartz. One of the things that struck me in listening to them was the realization of how old I am. <laughs> I didn't realize these books had been born so many years ago and are still alive. I'm going to talk and I'm going to read and then I'll answer questions. And I'm going to talk first about a novel that I began in 1953, which was more than 40 years ago. And it was the novel that began with the words with which it first came to me as an inspiration. And these are the opening words. It was love at first sight. The first time Yosarian saw the chaplain, he fell madly in love with him. Yosarian was in the hospital with a pain in his liver that fell just short of being jaundice. The doctors were puzzled because it wasn't quite jaundice. If it became jaundice, they could treat it. If it didn't become jaundice and went away, they could discharge him. But this just being short of jaundice all the time confused and irritated them. <laughs> a second character in this book, and an important one for plot structure, is the squadron commander, Major, Major, Major. <laughs> that is his real name, and, and because he was given that name by a father with a rather odd sense of humor, he was promoted to the rank of major the day he entered the army. <laughs> <laughs> Allowing me to begin the chapter about him with four majors. Major, 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 major had had a difficult time from the start. Like Minovichivi, he had been born too late. 
Major Major had been born too late and too mediocre. Now, some men are born mediocre. Some men achieve mediocrity. <laughs> and some men have mediocrity thrust upon them. With Major Major, it had been all three. <laughs> Even among men lacking all distinction, he inevitably stood out as a man lacking more distinction than all the rest. And people who met him were always impressed by how unimpressive he was. Uh, not long into the book, these two meet in what would be called a confrontation when Yossarian, after great efforts, succeeds in gaining an interview with him, and he tells him that he does not want to fly any more missions. At that time, he has flown 51. He doesn't want to be in the war anymore. Why not, Major Major asked. I'm afraid, said Yossarian. Oh, that's nothing to be ashamed of. We're all afraid. I'm not ashamed, Yossarian explained. I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> what could you do, Major Major asked himself. What could you do with a man who looked you squarely in the eye and said he would rather die than be killed? <laughs> a man who is at least as mature and intelligent as you were and who you had to pretend was not. But suppose everybody on our side felt that way, Major Major pointed out. I'd certainly be a damn fool to feel any other way, wouldn't I? What could you possibly say to him? Major Major wondered. One thing he could not say was that there was nothing he could do. To say there was nothing he could do would suggest he would do something if he could. <laughs> and imply the existence of an error or injustice. He must never say there was nothing he could do. I'm sorry, Major Major said, but there's nothing I can do. <laughs> <laughs> and that leads into the basic conflict because Major Major himself is a sympathetic character. Uh, the novel was published in 1961, eight years after I began it. And it was published to far from unanimously good reviews. In New York City, then and probably still the most influential publication is the Sunday Times book review section. And there the reviewer decided that Catch-22, as a novel, gasps for want of craft and sensibility, is repetitious and monotonous, it fails, it's an emotional hodgepodge and was not even a novel. <laughs> and in the esteemed magazine, The New Yorker, the reviewer there said that Catch-22 doesn't even seem to have been written. LAUGHTER <laughs> It's easier to laugh about it now than it was at the time. <laughs> Instead, it gives the impression of having been shouted onto paper. What remains is a debris of sour jokes. And in the end, Hella, this Hella, wallows in his own laughter and finally drowns in it. <laughs> Well, giving such encouragement after seven or eight years of work, <laughs> I knew I could succeed as a novelist, and several months after Catch-22 was published, sentences began buzzing around in my head, and they inspired uh, the second novel, Something Happened, and the sentences that did come to me, and which were the inspiration of the book, were these. In the office in which I work, there are five people of whom I am afraid. 
Each of these people is afraid of four people for a total of 20. <laughs> and each of these 20 people is afraid of six people, making a total of 120 who are feared by at least one person. Each of these 120 people is afraid of the other 119. And all of these 145 people are afraid of the 12 men at the top who helped found and build the company and now own and direct it. Everybody in the company is afraid of somebody else in the company. In my department, there are six people who are afraid of me and one small secretary who is afraid of all of us. <laughs> I have one other person working for me who is not afraid of anyone, not even me, and I would fire him quickly, but I'm afraid of him. <laughs> <laughs> Yosarian is alive at the end of Catch-22. And 30 or 40 years later, he reappears. In the novel closing time, 30 or 40 years older. I say 30 or 40 because I can't subtract from the time I began and published the book uh, and the time uh, this new book appears. In Catch-22, as you notice, it begins with your saying in the hospital, in chapter three of Closing Time, it begins with the Osarian in the hospital. He is 68 years old. He's in the midst of a second divorce. And the chapter, significantly, I think, is not titled the Osarian, but it's titled Mr. Osarian. And it begins this way, and it was with this opening sentence that the idea for doing Catch-22 came to me. In the middle of his second week in the hospital, Yosarian dreamed of his mother, and he knew again that he was going to die. The doctors were upset when he gave them the news. <laughs> we can't find anything wrong, they told him. Keep looking, he instructed. <laughs> You're in perfect health. Just wait, he advised. <laughs> Yosarin was back in the hospital for observation, having retreated there once more be beneath another barrage of confusing physical symptoms to which he had become increasingly susceptible since finding her himself dwelling alone again for just the second time in his life, and which seemed, one by one, to dissipate as soon as he described or was tested for each. Just a few months before, he had cured himself of an incurable case of sciatica, merely by telephoning one of his physicians to complain of his incurable case of sciatica. He could not learn to live alone. He could not make a bed. He would sooner starve than cook. <laughs> That's autobiographical. <laughs> <laughs> this time he had gone bolting back in with a morbid vision of a different morbid vision shortly after hearing that the president, whom he did not like, was going to resign, and that the vice president, whom he did not like even more, would certainly succeed him. And shortly after finding out that Milo Minderbinder, with whom he too now had been unavoidably and inescapably linked for something like 25 years, was expanding into military equipment with plans for a warplane of his own that he intended to sell to the government, to any government, of course, that could afford to buy. There were countries in Europe that could afford to buy and in Asia and the Mideast too. The vision of a morbid vision he had experienced was, a seizure of, was of a seizure or a stroke. Given a choice, Yosarian still preferred to live. 
He ate no eggs, and though he had no headache, he swallowed his baby aspirin every other day. He had no doubt he had lots to worry about. A prick in the White House? It would not be the first time. <laughs> Another oil tank had broken up. There was radiation, garbage, pesticides, toxic waste, and free enterprise. There were enemies of abortion who wished to inflict the death penalty on everyone who was not pro-life. <laughs> there was mediocrity in government and self-interest too. These were not delusions. He was not making them up. Soon they would be cloning human embryos for sale, fun, and replacement parts. Men earned millions producing nothing more substantial than changes in ownership. The Cold War was over, and there was still no peace on Earth. Nothing made sense, and neither did everything else. People did things without knowing why, and then tried to find out. Now, in conceiving the novel Closing Time, it occurred to me that I did not want to write about just Joe Saring again. He was not in a situation similar to that. He was in, in Catch-22, where the dangers and threats were immediate. Uh, what I wanted instead was to write about our time, my time, the present, maybe a little bit into the future, and to make this a book about the 40 or 50 years that have passed between the end of World War II and the present day. And to do that, I did expand the scope of the book, bringing in new characters, bringing in uh, new situations, and introducing different literary styles than I did use in Catch-22. And the novel begins with a character who really is not in Catch-22, certainly not as a personality. His name is Sam Singer, Sammy Singer. He's Jewish, he is from Coney Island, he's the same age as Yosarian, which means he's the same age as I am, and he begins a novel and he also ends it. And he starts the novel this way, announcing, I thought, for the reader what the book that follows is really going to be about. When people our age speak of the war, it is not a Vietnam but of the one that broke out more than half a century ago and swept in almost all the world. It was raging more than two years before we even got into it. Yet a million Americans were casualties of battle before it was over. 300,000 of us were killed in combat. Some 2,300 alone died at Pearl Harbor on that single day of infamy almost half a century back. More than 2,500 others were wounded. A greater number of military casualties on just that single day than the total in all but the longest, bloodiest engagements in the Pacific, more than on D-Day in France. No wonder we finally went in. Thank God for the atom bomb. I rejoiced with the rest of the civilized Western world almost half a century ago when I read the newspaper headlines and learned it had exploded. In only 20 years from now, certainly not longer, newspapers across the country will be printing photographs of their oldest local living veterans of that war who are taking part in the sparse parades on patriotic holidays. I never marched. I don't think my father did either. There were no elevators then in our brick apartment houses, which are three and four stories high. And for the aging and the elderly, climbing steps, going home, could be hell. Just one easy mile away in Coney Island was a celebrated amusement area with its gaudy light bulbs in the hundreds of thousands and the games and rides and food stands. Luna Park was a famous attraction then, and so was the Steeplechase Park 
of a Mr. George C. Tillu, who had passed away long before and of whom no one knew much. In those 20 more years, we will all look pretty bad in the newspaper pictures and television clips. Kind of strange, like people in a different world, ancient and doddering. And soon after that, there will be no more of us left. In the White House is a new president that Yossarian has described. Uh, he is a vice president who has come to the office when the president has resigned. Uh, and he has a code name that I'd be embarrassed to mention a mixed company uh, out of context. So the, the novel does extend to that area. It also extends to many different levels. Uh, much of the novel takes place or is centered on the, the bus terminal in the center of Manhattan, the Port of New York Authority bus terminal, which is presented in the novel very much the way it's known to exist, as a functioning, uh, a, a functioning enterprise uh, that in addition to working efficiently, moving 200,000 passengers in and out every day, does house just about all the levels of society in New York, economic levels and social, social levels, uh, right down to a criminal class, so much so that there is actually a police station in the bus terminal. Uh, it does not have the very rich. Uh, it's the only one that's lacking. Below the bus terminal is nothing. There are no basements or sub-basements in reality. In Catch-22, there is a labyrinth of basements and sub-basements, so I invented. Uh, and in one of the, on one of these levels, we are in the supernatural world. It's a world of memory, a world of the past. It's a world halfway, approximately halfway between the world we know and possibly the bottom of, uh, the bottom of hell. And uh, I move into the description of this in a chapter about Mr. George C. Tillu, who was mentioned as the founder of the Steeplechase Amusement Park that was there when I was a child, uh, is not there any longer, uh, and he's not there any longer. And the chapter reads this way. At a roll-top desk many levels below, Mr. George C. Tillu, the Coney Island entrepreneur who had been dead almost 80 years, counted his money and felt himself sitting on top of the world. His total never decreased. Before his eyes were the starting stations of the roller coaster he had brought down after him from his steeplechase amusement park. The tracks had never looked new as they rose toward the crest of the highest gravity drop at the beginning. He still filled with pride when he gazed at his redoubtable carousel, his El Dorado, constructed originally in Leipzig for William II, the Emperor of Germany, it still was possibly the most magnificent merry-go-round anywhere. He had renamed his roller coaster the Dragon's Gorge. Elsewhere he had his Cave of the Winds, and at the entrance churned his barrel of fun, which brought the unpracticed to their knees and kept them tumbling against each other in tilted disarray until they crawled out the farther end or were assisted by attendants or other customers more experienced. Onlookers of both sex took, sexes took special delight in witnessing the unbalanced distress of attractive ladies clutching to hold down their skirts in the days before slacks attained respectability as a befitting mode of female attire. If Paris is France, he could remember stating as the playground's foremost spokesman and impresario that Coney Island between June and September is the world. The money he sat counting every day would never deteriorate or grow old. With a genius uncanny in persistence, he had defied the experts, his lawyers and his bankers, and he had succeeded in time in taking it all with him, in holding on to everything he valued particularly and was intent on retaining. 
while heirs disputed with each other and with government tax officials, steeplechase, the funny place, relentlessly disappeared from the far face of the earth. He could not now think of anything he wanted that he lacked. He had more money than he ever could spend. He'd never trusted trusts or seen much foundation to foundations. John D. Rockefeller came to him regularly now to beg for dimes. And J.P. Morgan, who had commended his soul to God, would not, with no doubt it would be embraced, begged favors. With little to live on, they had not much to live for. Their children sent nothing. Mr. Tillyu could have told them, he told them often, without money, life could be hell. Mr. Tillyu had an inkling there would always be business as usual everywhere, and he could have told them, he kept telling them. His first major success was a Ferris wheel half the size of the one that had caught his fancy in Chicago, and he boldly proclaimed his own the largest in the world. He liked rides that went round and brought the participants back to the place they had started. Almost everything in nature, from the smallest to the grandest, seemed to him to move in circles and to return to the point at which it originated, to perhaps set out again. He found people more fun than a barrel of monkeys and he liked to manipulate them with tricks of harmless public embarrassment that would give pleasure to everyone and for which all would pay. The hat whisked away by a jet of air, the skirts gusting upward over the shoulders, the moving floors in collapsing staircases, and he still owned his own home. On Surf Avenue, across from his steeplechase amusement park, Mr. Tillyu had lived in a good-sized wooden frame house with a narrow walk and shallow steps, and all seemed to begin sinking into the ground shortly after his burial. By the time the whole house was gone, there was not much attention paid to one more empty lot in the dilapidated neighborhood that had passed its prime. On the north side of the narrow strip of land that made up Coney Island, lay a body of water called, aptly, Gravesend Bay. Fire was an ever-present danger in Coney Island, and great Coney Island fires blazed periodically. Within hours after Mr. Tillyu saw his first amusement park destroyed by flames, he posted signs selling his newest attraction, his great Coney Island fire. And he, and he kept his ticket takers busy collecting the 10 cents admission charge it took from customers eager to enter the devastated area to cast their eyes upon his smoking wounds. Why hadn't he thought of that, mused the devil. And even Satan called him Mr. Tillyu. If that is perhaps the lowest level, uh, present in closing time. The highest is one, it's in Washington, D.C., and it's the, uh, it's the White House. Uh, for, the, the, for the novel, I've created <laughs> an organized gang uh, of, of senators, House of Representatives, and White House staff, to which I give the name Cosa Loro which I'm told means their thing. And it is intended to suggest something uh, not incompatible with the Cosa Nostra, which is a better known organized, uh, uh, organized gang. Uh, what we have here is a man named Noodles Cook, formerly a friend and associate of, of Yosari, who wants to make the most out of his opportunities uh, being in the government. And he has been set up for an interview with the president, who was then the vice president. Uh, it's been felt the vice president has nine senior tutors with 11 doctorate degrees. It felt they have not been making him look too good, and they think Noodle Cook, Noodle Cook can come in and perhaps give an illusion of brilliance 
uh, to uh, an, uh, an office in the government that has, has no illusion of brilliance. Uh, not long ago, I was in Germany talking to an audience, and the translator read the section I'm going to read next in German. Uh, I don't understand more than one or two words of German, and I wasn't even sure what section he was reading uh, until I caught the name Mark Twain. Uh, and, and then I knew it was, it was this section uh, that I have, in, uh, I have before me. The audience liked it in German. Uh, maybe you will like it in English. Uh, it, it's Nudels Cook meeting the vice president for the interview necessary for him to be, receive an appointment if he wants to, if they want to give it to him. Come in, come in, come in, said the vice president jovially. I've been looking forward to meeting you. Vroom, 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 he said when they were alone in his office with the door closed. That's from a video game I'm undefeated at called Indianapolis Speedway. Do you know it? You will. Are you good at video games? I'll bet I can beat you. Well now, please tell me all about yourself. I'm dying to know more. For noodles, this was child's play. Well, sir, where should I begin? The thing about me, answered the vice president, is that when I've set my mind to do something, I've always been able to accomplish it. I'm not going to cry over spilt milk and what's past is past. Once I set a goal, I pursue that goal with a vengeance. I see, said Noodles, after a minute's surprise. And are you saying you had the goal of becoming vice president? Oh yes, definitely. And I pursued that goal with a vengeance. <laughs> what did you do? I said yes when they asked me to accept it. <laughs> <laughs> you see, Mr. Cook, may I call you noodles? To me, the word that best describes the office of vice president is be prepared. Or is that two words? <laughs> I believe it's too, sir. Thank you, Noodles. I don't think I could have gotten an answer that clear from my other tutors. And that's what I want to continue to pursue with a vengeance, being prepared. Obviously, the more days you have as vice president, the better prepared you are to be president. Don't you agree? Noodles dodged the question skillfully. Is that the goal you want to pursue with a vengeance next? It's the main job of the vice president, isn't it? My other tutors agree. Does the president know? I would not pursue it with a vengeance now unless he, unless he gave his approval. Is there anything more you wish to know about me that help, will help me decide if you're good enough for the job? Well, sir, said Noodle Cook and went ahead gingerly. Is there anything you're taking on now that you fear you might not be equipped to do on your own? No, I can't think of a thing. Then why do you feel you need another tutor to help me with questions like that one? <laughs> you see, I made a mistake in college of not really applying myself to my studies, and I regret that. You got passing grades anyway, didn't you? As good as I got when I did apply myself. You've been to college, Mr. Cook? You're an educated man? Yes, sir, I have my doctorate degree. Good, I went to college too, you know. We have much in common and should get along. Better, I hope, than I am getting along with those others. I have a feeling they made jokes about me behind my back. Looking back, I should have pursued philosophy and history and economics and things like that in college more. I'm making up for that now. How Noodles started and changed his mind. Sir, my experience has been I'm not going to cry over spilt milk, and that's past. My experience has been, Noodles threaded his way on with obsequiously, that people do what they are. A person interested in athletics, golf, and parties will spend time at athletic events, golf, and parties. It's very difficult in later life to grow interested in subjects like philosophy and history and economics if one was not attracted to them earlier. Yes. 
and it's never too late either, said the vice president. <laughs> and Noodles did not know whether they were in agreement or not. Lately, I've been studying the Napoleonic Wars to sort of round out my education. For a second or two, Noodles sat motionless. Which ones was all he could think to reply. <laughs> was there more than one? <laughs> that was not my field, answered Noodles Cook, and began to give up hope. And I'm doing the Battle of Antietam too, he heard the man who was next in line for the president continue. And after that, I'm going to have a crack at Bull Run. That was really a great war, that Civil War. We've not had one like it since, have we? <laughs> Are you preparing for war? I'm broadening myself. And I believe in being prepared. All of the rest of the work of a president is pretty hard, it seems to me, and very dull. I'm having all these battles put onto video cassettes and turned into games where either side can win. Vroom, vroom, vroom. Gettysburg too. Do you like video games? Which is your favorite? I don't have a favorite, Noodles muttered. Soon you will. Come take a look at these. On a cabinet beneath the video screen to which the vice president walked him lay a game called Indianapolis Speedway. Noodles saw others called bombs away and beat the draft. <laughs> and one more called die laughing. His host gave a chuckle. I have nine college men on my staff with 11 doctoral degrees and not one has been able to beat me a single time. Doesn't that tell you a lot about the state of higher education in this country today? <laughs> yes, said Noodles. What does it tell you? A lot, said Noodles. <laughs> I feel that way too. There's a new one coming out just for me called triage. Do you know it? No. Triage is a word from the French, and in case there's a big war and we have to decide which few should survive in our underground shelters, I know what the word means, Mr. Vice President Noodle interrupted sharply. I just don't know the game, he explained, forcing a smile. Soon you will. I'll break you in on it first. You would have your favorites and I would have mine. And only one of us could win and decide who would live and who will die. We'll enjoy it. I think I want you to specialize in triage because you never can tell when we really might have to put it into play. And I don't think those others are up to it. Yes, Mr. Vice President. And don't be so formal, Noodles. Call me prick. <laughs> <laughs> Noodles was appalled. <laughs> I could not do that, he retorted emphatically. Try. <laughs> no, I won't. Not even, even if it means your job? Not even then, Mr. Prick. I mean, Mr. <laughs> I mean, Mr. Vice President. See, you'll soon be doing it easily. <laughs> Take a look at these other things. How much do you know about heavy water? Nothing at all, said Noodles, feeling himself on firmer ground. It's got something to do with nuclear reactions, doesn't it? Don't ask me. I don't know much about it either, so already we've got a good meeting of the minds. <laughs> What's the problem? Well, they've got a man in custody who's producing it without a license. A retired chaplain from the old Army Air Corps. Why don't you make him stop? He can't stop. He's producing it sort of, if you know what I mean, biologically. No, I don't know what you mean. Well, that's what it says here on the synopsis of a summary of this classified folder codenamed Tap Water. He eats and drinks like the rest of us. But what comes out of him, I guess, is his heavy water. Where have they got him? Underground somewhere, in case he decides to turn radioactive. He was in contact with some kind of associate named Josarian just before they nabbed him. And then there's this other thing I want you to handle. 
about someone with a perfect war plane he wants us to buy and someone else with a better war, perfect war plane that he wants us to buy. And we can only buy one. I will want you to judge. Me, said Noodles, why not? I believe I'm not qualified. I believe in the flood, the vice president replied. I don't think I heard that. <laughs> I believe in the flood. What flood? <laughs> Noodles was befuddled again. Noah's flood, of course, the one in the Bible. And so does my wife. Don't you know about it? Through narrowed eyes, Noodles searched the guileless countenance for some twinkle of play. I'm not sure I know what you mean. You believe it was wet? <laughs> I believe that it's true in every detail that he took the male and the female of every animal species? That's what it says. So said Noodles with civility, we have by now cataloged more kinds of animal life than anyone could possibly collect in a lifetime and put onto a ship that size. How would he get them? Where would he put them? To say nothing of room for himself and the families of his children and the problems of the storage of food and removal of waste in those 40 days and nights of rain. You do know about it. <laughs> I've heard, said Noodles. And for 150 days and nights afterwards when the rain stopped, you know about that part too. The vice president regarded him improvingly. Then you probably also know that evolution is bunk. I hate evolution. <laughs> where, does all, where did all this animal life we know about come from? Oh, it probably just evolved. <laughs> you can look it up, Noodles. Everything we need to know about the creation of the world is right there in the Bible. Put down in plain English. The vice president regarded him placidly. I know there are skeptics. They are all of them reds. They are all of them wrong. There's the case of Mark Twain, Noodles could not be straining himself for arguing. Oh, I know that name. Mark Twain is that great American humorist from my neighboring state of Missouri, isn't he? Missouri is not a neighboring state of Indiana, sir. <laughs> and your great American humorist Mark Twain ridiculed the Bible, despised Christianity, detested our imperialistic foreign policy, and he piles of scorn on every particular in the story of Noah and his ark. Obviously, the Vice President replied, we are talking about different Mark Twains. <laughs> <laughs> Noodles was enraged. There was only one, sir, he said softly and forced another smile. If you like, I'll prepare a summary of his statements. No, I hate written things. Put it on a video, and maybe we can turn it into a game. And please don't call me son, Noodles. You're so much older than I am. Won't you call me Prick? <laughs> no, sir, I will not call you Prick. <laughs> Everyone else does. <laughs> and you have a right to. I have taken an oath to support that constitutional right. Listen, you Prick, Noodles said, and jumped to his feet and glanced around frantically for blackboard, for chalk, a point for anything. Water seeks its own level. Yes, I've heard that. Mount Everest is close to five miles high. For the earth to be covered with water, there would have to be water everywhere on the globe that was close to five miles deep. His future employer nodded, pleased that he finally seemed to be getting through. There was that much water then. And then the waters receded. Where could they recede to? Into the oceans, of course. <laughs> Where were the oceans if the world was underwater? Underneath the flood, of course, <laughs> was the unhesitating reply. And the friendly man rose. If you look at a map, Noodles, you'll see where the oceans are. 
And you'll also see that Missouri does border on my state of Indiana. Noodle's health was good. He was not on welfare. And it was understood now by all involved that as a secretary in charge of health, education, and welfare in the new cabinet, Noodles would focus his energy entirely on the education of the president. <laughs> as, I, as I said, uh, Yosarian is alive at the end of Catch-22. He is also alive at the end of closing time. Uh, the world may be coming to an end, but he feels he's doing all right. Through, through a form of coincidence, circumstance, he is underground when the president, in playing his video games, launches all the atomic missiles that we have at everybody who has been uh, programmed as a target. He is underground, uh, 42 miles underground, it says in this book, and he could remain there and be safe perhaps for as long as, perhaps forever, uh, if he w wants to remain there. Things happen there, he observes things there, he observes certain people there, including Milo Minderbinder, and he decides he doesn't want to be there, and he gives up that se security in order to keep a date with a girl uh, with whom, he, whom he's been seeing, who is pregnant, pregnant with, with his child, and. Uh, he decides to do that knowing if he comes up again and she's there, he will, he will marry her. And he does this uh, in a state of exaltation, which I describe. Yosarian, striding anxiously up the escalator to hurry back outside as fast as he could get there, was stimulated joyously by a resurrection of optimism, more native to Melissa than himself. The innate and inane conviction that nothing harmful could happen to him, that nothing bad could happen to a just man. This was nonsense, he knew. But he also knew, in his gut, he'd be as safe as she was. And he had no doubt then that all three of them, he, Melissa, and the new baby, would survive, flourish, and live happily forever after. The novel ends with Sam Singer, who's a different than Yosarian. He's alive also. He's a plane. Uh, his wife has died. He's alone and lonely. He's in a plane going on a trip around the world. But unlike Yosarian, Sam Singer had no illusions. Unlike Yosarian, he had no hopes of finding romance and falling in love again with somebody new. So the novel ends with both these main characters alive uh, and in good health and the future of the world uh, somewhat uncertain. Why do I keep them alive? Because despite my, my pessimistic view of the world, I think I am an optimist uh, when it comes to people I like uh, and I approve of, and I too have that innate and insane conviction that everything will work out well for all the people I like. And, the <laughs> <laughs> and I suppose there's an ulterior motive as well. If 30 years from now I want to write another novel and I, and I have no better idea, <laughs> when I'm 101 and your size is 101, I will still have him to go back to. Thank you. see me having difficulty climbing steps. Uh, it's a result of an illness I had many years ago. 
And if you see my hand shaking up there, it's not entirely from nervousness or drink. I, I, <laughs> uh, that's an after effect also, although every few minutes I regretted that I had no spirits to drink before I came up here. <laughs> you seem to be doing okay without them. Yes, you're, uh, you say you're an optimist. This takes the wind out of my sails because I was going to uh, propose to you that you were the blackest kind of pessimist, in fact. But um, I heard a man on the radio, uh, Eli, Eli Wiesel, talking uh, uh, on the occasion of uh, the uh, 50th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. And he said that uh, in our time, uh, it, there are two possibilities open to a thinking person. Uh, to be a weeping optimist or a smiling pessimist. Uh, he described himself as a, a weeping optimist. I would have thought you were a smiling pessimist if anybody was. Well, I, I think a smiling pessimist, if he's smiling, has an optimistic attitude toward those things that are of value and are capable of being enjoyed in the midst of an environment which is perhaps bleak and, and I think in our time and, and now the closing time is growing, growing more bleak. Uh, like your Sally and I feel there are things to be enjoyed, uh, <laughs> including a woman uh, who might or might not be pregnant. Uh, yeah. And I've, I've been interviewed uh, several times this week and one of the things I have to point out that in describing in closing time the conditions of the destitute in New York City yeah. uh, and the, kind of, the, the feeling of inadequacy in the part of yeah. government officials that these are not personal complaints. I myself am doing very well in this circumstance and one of the... Oh, yeah. uh, Real, really frightening divisions that's taking place in American so society is that as the number of poor increases, the number of very rich increases as well. And there is that great separation in the society, society in the United States. And I've come to feel that what happens in America will happen in England, and what happens in England will happen in other countries. I don't, I, I don't think I've answered your question, but no, I'm having a good time. That's all right. <laughs> We, we'll play it by ear. I think it's, uh, it's happening in England. It's happening in England, thanks to, thanks to Mrs. Thatcher. Uh, I, I think that uh, you see heaps of, uh, of uh, uh, people like refuse in the streets yeah. in London these days. Uh, and I suppose that uh, Thatcher and Reagan together help things in that direction. Um, your president, yes, uh, mental age of what, eight? What? Maybe 12. I mean, the, the president yeah. here? Yeah. And, and, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> he, apparently based on Dan Quayle, one is told. It, it was obviously based on Dan Quayle. <laughs> and Which is, uh, and what I was saying about you being a realist, in fact. Well, originally the chapter, that, that was a chapter of about 40 pages it's in the novel. Now it's one page because uh, by the time the novel was finished, Dan Quayle was out of public life and, yeah. and George Bush was out of public yes. life, yes. but uh, uh, it does represent, uh, it is timely and it is a, a realistic possibility that we, we in America face of having a president winning a nomination and winning election for reasons having nothing to do with intelligence, good character or even good intentions. And that man does have it as, he, he has, He's not very powerful in the states. Uh, Congress can hamstring him in almost every situation, but one power he does seem to have is the power to make war without the consent of Congress or, or the consent of people. That's quite a that's quite a, it, a it, clause. It, it is, but there's not you know, there's nothing I can do about no. it, and, and or, or, or anybody else. It's no. one of the things that has evolved. Yeah. So what you're doing is, in fact, you're, you're extrapolating from the circumstances, taking I, things just a little bit further. I, than I extrapolate, and one of the people writing about me when the book first came out said that Hella, Hella deals with problems and presents them, but he offers no solutions. 
And when I read that, I said, that's a very good description of me. I, I had not thought about that about myself, but I believe it's true in all my novels, and possibly it's also, by now it's even true in my, in my, my personal conversation. I, I have the, no I, solutions. I say this is a, yeah, essential condition of, of the literary artist. Uh, you're, now, you're uh, not supposed to provide solutions, well, are you? Well, that might be true uh, in, in the present time. I go back about 40 years when you had this, the novel that was social co of consciousness in the dramas, uh. and you had proletariat literature. Uh. Uh, and at that time, people, or certain critics, judged literary works by how involved they were in correcting social matters. Mm -hmm. uh, go back, uh, c come forward another 10 or 15 years, hmm. and implicit in, 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 in novels would be the corrective measures that ought to be applied. Uh, I don't know, I haven't thought about other novelists today and how they deal with problems. Uh, I have a feeling you have, and I'm running names through my mind, uh, I, I, I do think that you're probably right, that the serious writers today yeah. are not advocating anything other than an awareness of, mm -hmm. of atrocities. Yeah, yeah. Look at the world and uh, say this is the way it is. Yeah. Um, you read uh, your readings uh, r reminded me of a number of things Th that your jokes improve with repetition <laughs> uh, was one of them which is very nice uh, the, the variety of styles indeed in uh, closing time beginning in, with a sober speaking style almost documentary style yeah. of Sammy Singer and um, Moving, uh, uh, changing gear until you get into fantasy and apocalypse and go to Demerung at the end. I wasn't sure, uh, I, I, um, I didn't realize Yusarian was supposed to be alive at the end. I thought the, whole, I thought the last scenes were taking place in his uh, disordered well, fantasy. Uh, I don't carry the book through to its specific conclusion. The mm. probability is that we are involved in a nuclear war yeah. in which uh, other countries will strike back at the U.S. I don't carry it through to that literal conclusion. No, 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 no. I do hint, however, uh, and I, that's an open question, just at the end of Catch-22, we don't know what happened to Osarian. Uh, I do hint, ha however, at the unavoidable conclusion of our universe as is given to us by the physicists, by the scientists. Hmm. It's not that imminent. But in, in 200 million or 2 billion years, right. uh, the sun is going to turn black. Yeah. And in closing time, the sun is turning black. The moon is uh, turning to blood, yeah, yeah. and the ships in the sea are getting into collisions. Mm -hmm. So that there, there, was, there was several endings to closing time. Yeah, yeah, and, sure. and the one I prefer is the, interp the, is the interpretation about Yosarin and Sam Singer yeah. all alive. Yeah. Uh, they are in good health. Yeah. They are in their 70s, so neither yeah. one expects to be uh, as vigorous right. uh, 10 or 15 or 20 yeah. years from yeah. then. Yeah. Uh, but at, pre at, as it ends, they are there. Yeah. Which accounts for the, yeah, for the paradoxical upbeat feeling at the end of the book. Yeah. And, uh, and it has to do with, uh, with uh, in, in Yossarian's case, Parenthood. Huh? This is this, uh, the prospect of being a father. Is no, the thing no, that, no, that uh, brings him up to the surface. No, that's not it. He's, he's rather dismayed that the woman does. No, wants, we are, but that, no, that she that she wants the baby and doesn't want an abortion. Uh, he he would prefer that they, they get rid of it. But your Sarian being as big hearted as Joseph Heller will. <laughs> oh yeah. We'll yeah. make the concession she wants. Mm -hmm. Well, Liz, yeah. Uh, Oh no! You can you can Wait, dismiss I, his fatherly feelings, it, but it, it, I, I misunderstood your question. No, no, no. I think you're right because I use that word "resurrection of hope" at the end. Yeah. Now, what you do have again symbolically uh, there, I, I didn't want to emphasize it, is a a beginning. Yeah. The resurrection yeah. with, with 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 the birth of a child. Yeah. Uh, four or five times throughout the book. 
I deal with things coming to an end and beginning again. The one I read was George C. Till you like rise and go around a circle, come back to where they, they began and perhaps start out again. And what I'm suggesting there with that word resurrection is that things hopefully will begin again. Mm -hmm. Begin again in a very positive and uh, fulfilling way. I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think yeah, we ought to sure. stick around a while. Yes, yes. We are 200 million years. I mean, <laughs> I can live with that. Uh, yeah. But along the road, there are, there are uh, um, difficult situations. You reminded uh, us just now of uh, the way that Yossarian is unavoidably and inescapably linked to Milo Minderbinder. This is a fr uh, uh, yes. phrase which had struck me earlier as being very clearly, deliberately chosen words of yours there. Isn't this a terrible fact that your hero, your alter ego, one might say, your Sarian, is unavoidably and inescapably linked to this... I won't say it. Uh, Milo Minderbinder. Yeah. Well, Milo Minderbinder, uh, so as, as the epitome of the prophet motive, uh, 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 capitalism and, and free enterprise. Yes. Well, uh, yeah, but you could. Use, there are worse words for him than that. Uh, I, I wouldn't do it for my mind <coughs> by him because in neither book is he presented as somebody odious. Uh, uh, he's so why does Yossarian, Why is Yossarian inescapably what linked? Because apart from the, the reasons because of, it makes a good story. But no, it's not because he made a good story. A uh, uh, closing time is. Is, is not really a sequel of Catch-22, it's not even an uh, entirely companion novel or even a completion. It is a novel that is very much in contrast with Catch-22. Mm -hmm. in, in 1961, a novel about the war situation in 1944 could present somebody heroic and have him be credi credible and have him take a stand. Uh, uh, in, in, in which he is, he is outnumbered and the odds are against him. In 1991, two, three, four, five, my feeling is there's, no, number one, no room for heroes, either in literature or, or in our life. Uh, and the other thing is to dealing truthfully with the World War II generation, which is my own uh, and Yosari's. The war over, the danger passed, one then has to live, and Yosarian too has to live or die. If he wants to stay in America and grow older, uh, he's going to have to learn to adjust to the society in which he lives. He could be a rebel, uh, but the rebels don't last very long you know, in, in the U.S. or in other countries. They, mm -hmm. If they cause much of a stir, then, uh, then something is done about them. And Martin Luther King was a hero and, uh, uh, and a reformer, and, and he did not last very long. Uh, we had the period in 1968 of student uprisings uh, in Germany, in France, in Colombia, uh, in California. I can name, name some of the people who were heroes. One is Mark Rudd at Columbia. In France, it was uh, uh, Danny Bendit Cohn, I believe. Uh, in Berkeley, California, the free Mario Salvo. The, these were young men who became famous. Uh, for, uh, Abby Hoffman was another one. And they, they became famous and celebrated for, for, for four or five or six minutes. And Jerry Rubin ultimately went into stock brokerage. Abby Hoffman lived to a ripe old age or, or, or died from an overdose of drugs. Mm. Uh, that would be a different story to deal truthfully, I felt, with the necessities of existence in the Western world between 1945 and the present, and to present Yosarian as having done that, he would have to learn. And he did learn that uh, he would have to go to work. And when one wants to go to work, most people, they want jobs that are most compatible with their interests and abilities, and jobs that will give them the largest in income. Your salary has been married twice. For the first marriage, he's had four children. And most of us and most of the people we know who did marry after World War II and had children wanted to earn enough money to bring them up decently. And that is the way uh, Closing time is both a sequel to Catch-22, 
but a sharp contrast to it. Yossarin is a, is, a, is a representative man, isn't he? Almost as much as Bob Slocum in, in Something Happened. Uh, in, in that he less realistically presented, but he has a, a finger in everything, Yossarin, doesn't he? He does all kinds of different things. No, he has done things. It. It, no, what he's doing in Closing Time is deliberately left vague. He has done things working. But you make him, you make him to, into a representative figure by I make him giving a, him all kinds of vague activities. I, I wouldn't call that represent because he's got a lot of money in closing time and he's making a lot more. Oh, yeah. uh, he has done work that I did and most of the people <coughs> I knew did, knew in college did, which he has taught school and then he's, mm. uh, he's written advertising copy, he worked for public relations office uh, agency and had the ambition, which Sam Singer had as well, of succeeding as a writer of fiction, mm. uh, and did not. The difference between your Sally and me is, uh, is, is I did. He, he yeah. and Noodles Cook uh, have done the similar work, and uh, one or the other says that they would like, they look, they look for new jobs and, and trying to get some work associated with a product that's useful, mm -hmm. that they would use, or to write speeches, or do public relations for political candidates they, they would work for. Mm -hmm. And, and they've not been able to do that in the past. It's been uh, of small consequence to them. In that sense, I believe they are representative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the, the novels that projected by your sign are not projects that you yourself no, no, rooted. No, no. It, uh, it, it, in, in the novel, you know, and toys with certain things, including uh, an examination of his own position as Yosarian. Yeah, he doesn't yeah. say, but as Yosarian, who was the hero huh, of a huh. novel in Catch-22, and he muses on what would be a hero's life today. Yeah, and yeah. he uses the Wagnerian hero, Siegfried, and the yeah, God of Damaran, yeah. and constructs for his amusement a parallel between yeah. Siegfried and himself. Yeah. In doing that, he is mocking both Siegfried yeah. as a hero and uh, Yosarian as a hero. Yeah, and the novel is uh, commenting on itself. The novel does a lot of commenting on itself, does commenting on Catch-22. Which it, is something you haven't done in your, in your earlier work. Not as extensively as here. In Good as Gold, there is one chapter that begins with, with Bruce Gold has signed a contract to write a novel about being Jewish in America at, at, yes, at, at the yes, time he was. Yes. And uh, the way I uh, present the novel, he thinks it will be easy, he never gets around yeah, to yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. But he himself is the subject of the novel he's supposed to yeah, write. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's in the book that he's not writing. Yeah, yeah but yeah, at yeah. the beginning of one chapter, I said it struck Bruce Gold <laughs> that he was spending an awful lot of time in this book having lunch with people. Oh, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But it, uh, the Jewish experience uh, but, in America, yeah. yeah. But Closing Time does have a lot of comments about literature, yes. in, include, including my own works, yes. the works of Thomas Mann, the good soldier Strike is there, yes. or the novelists are there in person, or, or, the, or their work is there. It's a very compendious book. It, it, it's, it's about your own it's, work. And, uh, it's a magic stuff. mountain of a book. It's a magic <laughs> mountain of a book. Yeah, that's one of the... <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a, it's, a, it's a miracle that it hangs together. Well, I hope, I, 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 I'm glad you feel it does. Many of the reviewers were disturbed by the, uh, the difference in styles and between uh, Sam Singer. There's another character, a friend of his named Lou Rabinowitz, yeah. who has long chapters. The prose style is different. The sentiments in, in, in relating yeah. Yeah, the, the a, experience are different. Yeah. Whereas the Osarian sections do, yeah. they move into fantasy and, yeah. and surrealism. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, then have these, and then, yes, one has to make these switches from surrealist yeah. to fantastic material to sober. Yeah, people don't. Uh, I found this with Catch But life is like this. Life yeah. is like that, and literature is like this. Yeah. Uh, one of the reasons Catch 22 never became a bestseller and was. Oh, it did, in, in, it, didn't it? No, not in the U.S. A steady seller. Probably. Well, yeah, but I mean, make a best seller uh -huh. that was irritating to people, particularly viewers, is that it was an unfamiliar type of novel to yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, closing time was an unfamiliar type of yeah. novel. Something happened yeah. was as well. well. And you feel it hangs together. I uh -huh, feel yeah. it hangs but together. I'm feeling it more. More, more oh. than I did when I first read it. I have mm -hmm. to confess this. And I confess to you that reading... Uh, Something happened 20 years later, 
yes. got much more out of it than I had the first time. Because, uh, uh, I don't know whether the book's changed. I think the book has changed as well as me. The book hasn't changed. <laughs> <laughs> It's like good uh, wine. I, I'm an irritating yeah. writer because I mix your move yeah. with, I think, I think with you, pessimism. I think you, your books need to be read twice. Oh, more than twice. <laughs> more than twice. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, pardon. No, no, they should. They, uh -huh. they, they must be read. No, times. they should be read continually. Yeah, continually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, often, in fact, throughout, <laughs> throughout my life as a writer, I've said to myself, or I said to people five or six years apart, I'm truly glad I don't have to review this novel of mine. Because yeah. uh, I, would, uh, I really don't know how to describe it. If I had only 800 words or 1,200 words no. to do it, no. I, I would not be able to do it. It's a hard job. I wonder whether um, anybody from the audience would like to say anything. We haven't given anybody well, any, if any the, opportunity to speak. I don't know whether... Uh, if they're going to, I think we should bring the lights up so we can see a hand raised. It would make it easier. Oh, w <laughs> what he's saying is, we're, ready, they, now, I'll, I'll, we're ready now to yes. answer questions if you have any. Uh, if the lights... Go ahead, yeah. I see somebody there. I can just see some. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 think I, I think I have the question. Are you in school when Catch-22 was published? She wonders if I'm aware of how right. deeply or widely influential it was to, to, to you and your generation. I was not aware of until a day or two ago. <laughs> When in the course of being interviewed, I'm, I'm asked that question, and during one of the interviews in a small restaurant where there was not much privacy, a, a man at the next table got up to leave, and he stopped at the table in the middle of the interview and said, he, he, forgive him for interrupting, but he couldn't help overhearing. He was an American. He said, I want you to know you're wrong. Your book was, was greatly influencing, a great influence to all of us. So now, now I'm coming around to believing that novels can have an effect. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, could, could I remember what my feelings were at the time those very bad reviews came out and how do you deal with it? I can remember very well the feelings at the time the Sunday Times review came out because weeks before it was published I had heard through my agent that the review was a devastating attack on the, on the novel and on the publishers for publishing it. And the, the knowledge was extremely oppressive for weeks upon me and my family, and I found myself praying that they didn't, they would not run the review at all, rather than run it uh, uh, that bad review. What they finally did was they cut a long review down to a single column in the back. It was supposed to be a very prominent review. Uh, the Times did not like the review when they got it but they, they felt they, they uh, had, had to run it. How you deal with it, there's no way to deal with it. Uh, you just hope that other reviewers will praise it and you hope that the bookstores will be enthusiastic and that people will, will, will buy the book and read it, which is what did happen. Uh, it, it happened slowly. Catch-22, as I said, never made a bestseller list. But at the end of the year, when the paperback edition came out, it was selling as well then as it had been selling all year long. And by the time the paperback edition came out, it burst. It was an outburst of popularity for it. There's no way to deal with bad reviews. What happens here with closing time of subsequent novels is they are, have less an effect 
on, on, on my reputation or, and, and on my income. But to be frank, <laughs> to be frank, well, for first novelists, it can be devastating. To get, to, to get bad reviews means that uh, the reviews will be very small. If the novelist is unknown, he's not going to get prominent reviews anywhere. Perhaps, uh, yeah, perhaps it's... Uh, the only worst thing is to have no reviews at all. Have no, no news, have no, no reviews news is good news. Yes. I mean, no news is bad yeah. news in that case. No news is no news. Well, it, it, it was not all around me. I picked out those two reviews for, for, for effect. <laughs> no, the, the Daily Times review was very good. Uh, it came out a few weeks after this review did, and reviews in certain publications were very good. These were particularly painful because they w read in New York City, and I live in New York City, and they're read by people I know, my neighbors. <laughs> and as, as painful as the reviews were, even more painful is to have people call you up and say, how do you feel about it? Wasn't it awful what they did? <laughs> I say this in good as gold and I found out to be, to be true. Let me get a bad review in an English speaking publication anywhere in the world. The Singapore, the Singapore Weekly, the, uh, the, the, the Bally Times. And somebody I know will read it and bring it to my attention. <laughs> but, uh you had that very important good review, though, from well, Philip Toynbee in The Observer. Well, that was in England. In England, I should say, the reception was uh, enthusiastic from the day of publication. And in England, they were just starting bestseller then. Yeah. And, and Catch-22 was, was the leading bestseller there. Is there anybody up on top that has a question? I mean, yeah. I yeah. One, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, pleased, I'm pleased to hear it from a woman who's read my books and likes them, and she wonders why, in mentioning other books I've done, uh, I, I didn't mention Picture This. Uh, I felt for in selecting uh, remarks and, and sections to read for this occasion that I should concentrate on closing time, and Catch-22 is an introduction uh, a du a directed toward it. Something happened, ca came up because it was transitional. I, ha I didn't mention God Knows, I didn't mention Good as Gold until recently. If you have me back here in another few weeks and, and, and want me to give a speech called My Life as a Novelist, I will discuss all my books. I like picture this very much also. There, there was no attempt to forget it. A, a picture of this is a novel, and again, it's a very unusual type of novel, uh, dealing with Rembrandt, and dealing with Socrates and Plato, and dealing with the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, and with, 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 with the government, and having almost no characters in it. I was going to try to write a novel that has no people in it, no, nobody invented. And throughout, in that whole novel, there were only two dialogues I create, I believe. One between Rembrandt and his son, which lasts a few pages, and one between uh, Socrates and uh, Alcibiades. Uh, other than that, everything there in the form, uh, one between Rembrandt and Jan Six, the, the, the subject of the man in Amsterdam, of, of the portrait, which nobody can get to see because it's still in the private house. Uh, and I, there's a, a one-page dialogue there, but it was an attempt to write a novel in which information would be the whole content of it, and it, it, it's organized with the presentation of facts. I would describe it as a novel. It's, a, it's an unusual form of novel, uh, and uh, perhaps not as popular uh, in other places uh, as it seems to be here where a number of people have commented on it. Um, up there, yeah.
Well, I, the answer to your question is why should he read a book in which, which the author deals with problems for which he has no solutions and focus on things that are, are dispiriting and disappointing? There's no reason you should read any book, number one. Number two, if you're going to exclude, eliminate reading novels that fit those descriptions, you will probably not come in touch with a single novel that would be regarded as good, very good, or even great. That's the nature of literature, of serious literature. Uh, the nature is to deal, uh, to deal with events as though they were very serious and almost never uh, susceptible to satisfactory solutions. Perhaps I could, I'd like to add one word to that. Uh, if, if, you're in, if you're only interested in solutions, then there's no point in reading the book. You just read the solution. <laughs> I, I didn't hear that. Uh, adding to that, the most famous plays of Shakespeare was possibly the greatest writer ever to write uh, of all tragedies in which the hero, usually likable, usually sympathetic, dies. And the same thing is true of Greek tragedies. And, and, and uh, tragedies seem to have a, a more lasting effect on audiences than comedies. But uh, an interesting question. Anyway. Uh, I think we have time for... Oh, we have lots of time. I don't, I don't leave till Sunday. Fine. We have time. Yeah. I don't want to yeah. be a spoil sport. I'm sorry, I, start over again, please. <laughs> I think you may have hit on it, although the motive was not was unconscious until you just brought it to light. <laughs> uh, there are several places in the novel where the names of real people are used, and often they're introduced with the names of people who are well-known in literature. I can give you other reasons, to one or two or three other reasons why my own name as a kid is introduced, Joey Heller. They wouldn't justify its being included if you disapproved of the use. I think that the, the, the most appealing thing uh, about it was, once the idea occurred to me, that it would be a striking surprise anybody reading the novel. And I could justify it another way too. Sam Singer is so convincingly autobiographical and yet he is not entirely me. And that by he mentioning uh, Joey Heller, it's one way of perhaps s signaling the reader that Sam Singer is not Joseph Heller. It's a friendly book, though. You bring in lots of uh, people that you like. Yes, and, and in fact, there's, uh, yeah, Kurt Vonnegut is present in the book as a person along with the good soldier Schweik. Mm. Uh, they are both there as characters. Vonnegut is a living figure, Schweik is a, li is a literary, literary figure. Uh, are, you, are you ready to conclude this? You seem to be. No, I'm, no, I'm not. No. I realize I have other things to do between now and Sunday. <laughs> And, and, and among them is to sign books, if you have any you want me to sign. We can go on for that. Yeah. 
I, I knew that question was come up. Did I have anything to do with the movies? Was I involved with Mike Nichols? And how did I feel about the movie of Catch-22? I had nothing to do with the movie of Catch-22. I had one meal with Mike Nichols shortly before he was going to go off to film it. it. It was a courtesy. I did like the movie very much. And I was flattered by the very features that led to its being a, a, a disappointment and a financial fa failure. They made a very serious effort, he and the scriptwriter, to put everything in the book on screen with, with the fidelity to the work, which novels, uh, most novels, I, I can't finish a sentence, I'm getting tired. One of the things I said to Nicholas at that meeting, I said, watch out. Don't be too faithful to the book, because if I had wanted to write a, a screenplay and use the ideas of Catch-22, it would be very much different from the novel. They did want to reproduce the book. It was a serious movie they made. It was not popular. It was released at the time when the mass audience for movies had grown so large, and most of them liked entertainments rather than serious movies. In the movie MASH, which came out a few months before Catch-22, was a tremendous success at the box office, as they say. Catch-22 was disappointing at the box office. And MASH went on for years. Uh, well, that, that was on television. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one more question. Yeah. Uh, what was the question? Are you, are you, I, am I seriously are you, planning are you another, planning another no. sequel? <laughs> no. It, it, but it could very well be if I live 30 more years and if I'm still writing novels, I may get a notion of writing a book about a man of 101. I have no idea what my next novel will be about. I never have had more than one idea for a book at a time. Uh, it will not be, as, I don't think it will be, <laughs> deal with the characters in closing time. It will not deal with the Osarian. But it's good, to, it's good to know you're thinking in terms of another novel. Oh, I have nothing else to think about. Nothing else to do. <laughs> once, once Mr. Amelaine stops inviting me to Amsterdam to talk to people like you, I, I will have nothing to do but stay home and think. It's just that, it's just that closing time is so compendious. It could almost have a valedictory feeling about it, but uh, it I, doesn't. Uh, yeah, I, I'm sorry you feel that way. No, I, I, don't. I, I feel that way also. And, it, and it's been very hard for me to imagine what my next novel should be like or should be about. Mm -hmm. I have no idea yet. Mr. Schwartz? Well, you did tell me that you were freeing up some space on your hard disk, so I haven't given up hope. Well, this was a ball. Thank you all very, very much for coming. Um, we'll finish with, we're not finished yet, there's a signing session, and uh, you're requested you. just to let Joseph Heller write his name and not to ask for dedications, um, just to uh, allow him to uh, help as many of you as possible. Um, this isn't yet the end of the John Adams Institute, and I'm happy to be, with, uh, be able to announce our Next lecture, which will take place in the West India House on the 2nd of May, Robert Olin Butler, Pulitzer Prize winner for his book on Vietnamese immigrants in America, will be coming to speak. And uh, we hope to see you back not only then, but at many times in the future uh, with your and God's help. Thank you very much. Thank you.